Welcome back to more Money Minutes for Doctors. Today, we're going to be talking about four financial mistakes that young doctors make. Catherine Vesna is here. I'm the CEO and founder of MD Financial Advisors, and it's my very great privilege to be working with my de facto partner today and my chief investment officer, Josh Lance. Welcome, Josh. Thanks for having me. So Josh and I work with all types of doctors, and we see a wide variety of finances, but there's a common trend among young doctors that's going to be hard to miss. So today we're going to go over the top four financial mistakes that we see a lot of young doctors make and talk to you about how you can avoid falling into the same pitfalls. Now, for further questions or if there's something you'd like us to cover in a future episode, please, please reach out to us at mdfinancialadvisors.com. Our email would be info at mdfinancialadvisors.com. And please don't forget to like, subscribe, and follow us on social media at MD Financial Advisors. That way you won't miss an episode, and it really does help us in the ratings. So thank you very much. So young doctors today have a lot of paths available for them. But if they're not careful with their financial decisions early on, they can be digging themselves into a hole that can take years to get out of, or maybe even impossible to climb out of. And often these problems arise from what we're seeing recently as four basic mistakes. Here's what we call those four. Number one is doing things in a sequence. Number two is buying too big of a home. Number three is losing their will to save. And the final is something called recency bias. So Josh, let's start from the top. What do you mean about doing things in a sequence? Yeah, so we find that there is a tendency to want to do things in steps or a sequence. It's I want to tackle this particular financial thing in my life. And then when I am done with that, I will move on to this next financial thing in my life. So it's very common for doctors to want to, let's say, pay down debts first. Okay. There's nothing wrong with that. that that's good. We don't like debts. We, we like uh, building plans to help doctors get out of debts. Uh, but you want to do things in a plan. You want to think holistically. And sometimes it might make sense to do a combination of things. So instead of just one thing at once, let's combine multiple things. Um, so when it comes to building wealth, you need to build up assets over time. You convert those assets into income later on in retirement. That's what passive income is all about. And in order to do that, you need to take advantage of the compounding. You know, the miracle of compound interest. Everyone's heard that, that term. And that's where you invest money early and you have money that grows on top of your money and you can build wealth. So example, you got $100,000, you get a 5% return, it grows to $105,000. The next year, if you earn 5%, you're growing it not on the $100,000, but you're growing it on the 105,000. So you get compounding. It's very important to start that early. Anyone that's run these numbers, the length of time of the compounding matters greatly. So if you run 10 years of compounding, it doesn't make near the difference as say 30 years of compounding. So you wanna start early and compound those dollars. Now, what does this have to do with the sequence? Well, if you wait and you do things in steps and you say, pay down all your debts or you do your home renovation projects and then you wait to save, essentially. What happens is you have less time to do that compounding. So instead of starting the compounding in your 30s as a doctor, you're then starting your compounding, say, in your 40s. And a lot of doctors are retiring, say, in their mid-60s. So you know, the end point is roughly the same. So that leaves you less runway to be able to compound those dollars. And so that's that's a big deal. Um, and it translates into a lot less wealth over time. So it's important to just think holistically, have someone run the numbers both ways. It might still make sense to really accelerate those debt pay downs. A lot of that depends on your interest rate, your current situation but work with a professional to look at that holistically and try and do multiple things at once. You're saving and paying down debts at the same time, not getting stuck in a sequence. 
I can't agree with you more, Josh. And typically what we find is the doctors will tell us, well, I've got to get paid, my student debts paid off. Josh mentioned that. And then when they get that paid off, rather than, they, rather than starting their savings, which is what they'd originally thought, now they're wanting to buy a new car, the Tesla or what have you, or they want to put the money in a big house or they want to go on a vacation and they just keep putting it off and putting it off and putting it off. And very often by the time these doctors finally do get around to us in their late 50s, they're shocked that they have they just don't have enough money to retire when they want to retire. They're burnt out. They're tired. They just can't do it. So I totally agree with Josh. We're all in favor of pay paying down debt, sometimes even prepaying debt, depending on your situation. But I absolutely, at the same time, you have to start saving the sooner the better to make advantage of the compound interest. And for some of our clients, we actually start with maybe it's only $500 a month. But it's something so that they can get they can get started. Obviously, we'd like them to start with more because they're going to have much, much better outcomes. So give this a, some thought. And uh, another way to think about this is there's a very popular book now that's out for entrepreneurs called Make Profits First, Put Profits First. And it's an interesting thought when it comes to an entrepreneur. They tend to have their money come in, their revenue come in, they pay out expenses. What's left over is their profits. But this book gets them to think about reversing that whole equation. And no, I want to put a target of having profits of X amount this year as an entrepreneur. In order to do that, I need to get my revenues up to a certain level and my expenses down. So they keep the profits as their focus and their goal for the year. And I thought, you know, that really is so true when it comes to doctors, too, and to Josh's point. Make the target about the amount you're going to be saving and then work backwards and figure out with what's left over. Do we have money for the new car, the house, the, uh, the prepaying the debt? So to Josh's point, you're in doing a couple things at the same time. All right. Number two on our list, which I alluded to in just a minute, is buying too big of a home. Yeah, so this is a, a common trap a lot of doctors get into. Um, so, you know, what happens is they buy too big a house. And right now you couple this with the really high interest rates, maybe you're paying 6.5% because, you know, we're talking to you in June of 2023 and rates are really high right now. Um, you get too big a house and then there's not enough money left over for doing things like putting your kids through college, saving for retirement, um, you know, paying for some of your other goals, paying down your debts. Um, so getting into too big a house can be really troublesome to the rest of your financial plan. And, and you, if you think about it, it's, it's largely an irrevocable decision because when you get into too big a house, it's not, it's really hard to then, you know, a couple of years into it, decide, oh, I got into too big a house and say, I'm going to sell that house and downsize and do something different. That is hard. I, irrevocable is the wrong word, but it's close to it because no one really wants to go through all the headache of that. Um, it's very hard to unwind that. So that's, that's the issue. The solution is you need to figure out the missing variables in your financial life. So there's, there's a lot of variables you probably know. Calculate how much you're spending on your living expenses each month. Calculate your student loan payments. Maybe you're not paying those right now and they're going to start up later this year. But you need to calculate those. Those are some variables a lot of our clients um, can calculate on their own. And they might not need assistance with that. Some of the variables they don't know how much do you need to set away for retirement? You want to work with a professional. They can use advanced software to calculate different growth rates, inflation rates, all those various tax assumptions, all that stuff, and solve for what do you set aside? What do you pay yourself first with? That's a missing variable for a lot of our clients. Rough rules of thumb are not going to work. Calculators online are not going to work because your situation is going to be custom to you. You might have the desire to retire early in your 50s or in your 60s. And those numbers look completely different um, depending on when you're retiring. Your lifestyle might be different in, retire in retirement. So you want to work with a professional to solve for that. In addition, there is a big priority in our doctor's life to provide for their children and in particular, their kids' education. 
we find that as a very high value for a lot of our clients. And, you know, our, our clients have really bright children and they want to send them to, you know, expensive schools. So you want to calculate those numbers too. Um, and, you know, work with a professional to figure out what that's going to be based on your goals. Well, these are some of the missing variables. You need to solve for this uh, first to then figure out what is left over for housing. Once you do that, you can then figure out how much of a purchase price of a house you can actually afford. That's the proper way to do that. Uh, essentially, you're reverse engineering things. If you do it that way, you'll be safe because you've solved for what do you set aside for your future and you won't get into too big a home where you can't afford everything else. But that's how we would encourage uh, all doctors to do this, but we find it, it really hits a lot of younger doctors. There's so much we could do a whole program just on this particular issue. Josh is right. It's almost an irrevocable decision because if you buy that big house at the top of the market, the market crashes. Even if you do want to scale down, you really can't because a lot of times your mortgage is higher than what the value of the house is now. You can't actually even sell it. We've seen that happen to dozens and dozens of doctors. So that's a bad trap to fall into. And I certainly agree with Josh's approach. We're one of the few firms I know that actually works this way. When we have a client who wants to buy a house, we want them to reach out to us. And by the way, we want them to have a fabulous house. We want them to have a place that they really, really enjoy. But to my conversation earlier, we don't want it to sabotage their savings program. So we do work backwards to figure out they can afford a house between X and Y without sabotaging their savings program and their goals. Or another way to think about this is every decision you make, whether it's buying the house, the car, putting your kids through school, whatever it is, is getting you one step closer to financial independence, or it's pushing that date out another year or two, sometimes even longer. And that may be okay, as long as you're aware of the impact of your decisions. So once again, don't make yourself house poor. All right, third thing we, we see is Doctors who've lost their ability to save. What are you seeing with that, Josh? Yeah, so this is a common, not their ability, it's their willingness to save. Their willingness. I, this is a common pattern um, that I'm seeing with a lot of younger doctors. Basically, we see a lot of doctors when they're first getting out of their training, they're actually very motivated to want to save and do all the right things. And, you know, they... <laughs> have the higher income, they want to get into the proper size house, they want to save the right amounts, you know, all that, which is fantastic. And we so encourage that. And that puts them on a much better path. But what we find is the pattern is after a couple of years that kind of gets boring. And so in, in combination with it getting boring, there's also other competing interests. Um, there's some lifestyle creep, things are getting more expensive. Uh, they want to do some renovations on the house or whatever it is, or now they have a young family and they, they want to do more travel. And those things are all great. We want our, our clients to be able to do all their goals. But what we find tends to be on the chopping block is their long-term savings. And we want to point out, this is your savings. This is to protect your future self. Um, and if you stop that today or you lower that, the challenge is you're not going to get the advantage of that compounding interest over time. Um, and so to Catherine's point, that might put you back a year or two or, or beyond uh, for financial independence and when you can actually, you know, stop at work. So we just encourage everyone to, you know, solve for what they need to save for and then, you know, keep that strong and keep it going. And you'll be put on a really, really good path and, and to not lose that consistency in your savings plan. Oh, so smart. Once again, it might be profit first for the entrepreneur. For our clients, it's their savings and investment first. Same thing, paying, paying yourself that. And I so agree with Josh. Once you set that goal and you go, this is carved in granite, I don't care what it takes, I'm going to do this, then it's easier for you to make those decisions. Does it make sense to take that trip Maybe we don't go take expensive trips twice every year. Maybe we take one cheap trip and one big one. We do whatever it takes to be able to fit those long-term goals. And your future self will be very, very happy with you if you do that. All right, last one is recency bias. 
This is a word you don't hear often. So you might explain to us what the word recency means and what is a recency bias? So recency bias would be an overemphasis on recent events. So you're basically assuming that things that have happened more recently are going to be the way it happens, you know, going forward in the future. And so where this comes into play, we see a lot of doctors that want to invest in the rearview mirror, meaning they want to look at what's done well lately, what are the hot trends, what are the fads, and do that. Now, this comes up a lot because, you know, you're speaking to your friend, your friends, your colleagues at the water cooler and investments come up. Well, people are not going to talk about the investments that have done poorly the last 10 years. They're only going to talk about the stuff that's done fantastic. So some really common examples of this, um, you know, cryptocurrencies were a big fad. Um, when Robinhood came out, uh, a lot of doctors got into individual stock picking. Uh, that became really popular. Housing. So, you know, for some reason, everyone, um, you know, has gotten into some kind of real estate investing. Well, there's, there's good reason for that. Housing has done fantastic uh, since the great financial crisis in 2008. Um, and I think this is valuable here. Let me show a visual here of a recency bias. Here is an index that tracks house prices, okay? And this is uh, relative to inflation rates. So in other words, when the line's going up, housing is growing more than inflation, okay? So if we look at 10 years, we see that there's a nice little trend line that we see house prices are going up and they're going up more than inflation over time. But let's zoom out, okay? Suddenly we see a different story here. That was the housing bubble. It's a great financial crisis. And then, you know, we can see this is the experience of a lot of our clients, uh, in particular, a lot of younger doctors. They've only seen housing go up um, during that period of time. And that tends to influence their decisions. Suddenly they want to do just a lot of real estate um, in their portfolio. Uh, let's zoom out some more, 50 years, okay? Completely different story, 80 years. Look at how flat that was. It's basically keeping up with inflation, in other words, for that period of time. It's only more recently in the last two decades that we've seen real estate begin to behave this way. And there's, there's reasons for that. But that's an example of recency bias. It's chasing the thing that's done hot recently. We're not saying real estate is bad or you shouldn't have that as part of your portfolio. We're just saying you need to be mindful of, is this a recent trend versus is this something that works in the long run? Um, and not load up on just the stuff that's worked more recently. I think one of the things I see driving this recency bias is FOMO, fear of missing out. And, and as I started looking at some of the doctors that are in this FOMO, they see, tend to be maybe older, 40, I'm saying maybe late 40s, early 50s or so. And they're just now going, oh my gosh, I should start paying attention to this. I've got to play catch up. And they start looking around for these hot trends, thinking they can hit it hit it rich quickly and kind of make up for lost time. Or maybe they hear about their colleagues and they think their colleagues are doing so well. What has your experience been with that, Josh? Yeah, I think FOMO drives a big part of this. Um, they've heard what their colleagues are doing. They want to be, um, you know, in on that action. Um, it, it's just being more aware. I think being aware of long-term performance of various investments. So what has it done over the last 100 years is really valuable. I'll give you another example. International stocks versus domestic stocks. Domestic stocks have done really, really good the last 10 years. International stocks, not so good. But what we find in the longer picture is it tends to switch every decade. You'll have internationals that do really well for 10 years, and then it'll flip, and then domestic does really well. So what's happened more recently is domestic did really well. And what happens is we tend to find a lot of the doctors we first meet, they have only domestic stocks in their portfolio. 
And they're just investing in those because that's what's done really well more recently. It's investing in the rear view mirror. And then what happens, international does really well, say the next 10 years, that very well could happen. And then they switch, they figure it out later and then they switch and then <laughs> it reverses course again. And so they end up always kind of investing um, behind the eight ball and you don't want to do it that way. Definitely, definitely not. I'm thinking about one doctor I know who, oh gosh, this may be five or eight years ago now, was investing in Blue Apron. That's one of those meal prep services that have gotten really, really popular in the last eight years or so. And he put 5,000 and he had not started, he was a very young doctor, hadn't started investing at all. This was like his first big investment. And I'm like, how did you decide on $5,000 in Blue Apron? He says, well, we just liked the product and we wanted to support them. And I thought, oh boy, this is going to get ugly. But why? Because I've seen so many of these deals go through in all the many decades I've been doing this. Sure enough, I ran some numbers recently. I think he's lost about 97% of investment. Blue Apron is now penny, a penny stock the last time I, I checked. 97% of $5,000 is a pretty big loss. I much prefer approach that's I think of it as the rabbit and the hare approach. I'm sorry, the, the tortoise and the hare, not the rabbit and the hare, the tortoise and the hare, that slow, steady investments. We use mutual funds with very low internal fees. We use an evidence-based approach. It's very methodical over time. And we kind of ignore the FOMO. We ignore the recency bias. We ignore all of that and we just stick to the science. Yeah, Josh, do you want to comment about that? Uh you know, I, I, I was going to comment just as a sidebar, if you want to help support a company, it's, uh, it's better to just buy from that company to, than to buy their stock, right. um, just so everyone knows. Um, and, you know, I, I think to Catherine's point, you want to use an evidence-based approach. That's how you practice medicine. You want to do that with your investing. And so part of that is, what does the empirical evidence show? What If we look back, say, over 100 years, what actually works in the long run, that's what we want to do. And so I think it's important that your investment plan matches up with that. Really, really good point. All right. So in closure, you know, I just put so much time and money into their training and their chosen path. They don't always give the same attention to their finances, which is really a shame. And especially in the early years of your careers. So this can lead to an imbalance and unfortunately lots of headaches down the road. But if you start early, you take care, you avoid these four mistakes that we've talked about today, you can avoid these issues before they ever start to occur and get much, much further down the path to getting wealth span. Having wealth that gives you financial independence. So one day work is optional for you. All right, please follow us on social media. And if you found this helpful, we always love it when you forward it on to a colleague. And finally, you can send us our questions and topics for future issues. And if you want to reach out to us directly for a second opinion on your financial health, you can do that by emailing us at info at mdfinancialadvisors.com. So please take care of yourself, your health, your wealth, and prosper. 